In the last few episodes, we've been busy building up a basic clock and reset generator for our processor. This thing lets us manually step uh, the processor through individual clock cycles or let it run on its own and probably reset everything in general. And with that done, it's time that we actually start to build the processor itself. Um, be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see this project unfold. The fundamental task of a processor is to execute a program. So a good starting point might be to ask ourselves what exactly a program is and how the processor is supposed to run it. So let's look at such a program. At its core, a program is just a list of instructions, one after the other. In practice, these instructions will be things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, loads and stores, shifts, and a lot more, uh, each of them performing a very specific task. Our processor is supposed to execute these one after the other. To do this, it keeps track of the current instruction it's at, executes it, and moves on to the next instruction. The thing that keeps track of the current instruction is usually called a program counter. Realistically, programs don't only execute instructions in order, but they also contain jump instructions to cause the processor to go to different parts of the program. This allows us to execute code multiple times in a loop, uh, skip over pieces of the program, or implement something like function calls. So for example, our processor would start executing a program from the top, and then it might encounter a relative jump telling it to jump ahead by three instructions. Or a relative jump uh, telling it to jump backwards by five instructions. Or uh, an absolute jump telling it to jump to instruction eight in the program. Now this is all pretty abstract. In reality, this program is going to be stored somewhere in a memory. Um, this means that jump instructions actually contain the relative and absolute memory addresses of where they want to go. To execute an instruction, the processor would present the address of the current instruction, which is stored in the program counter, to a memory. And in response, the memory would present the data stored at that address, which corresponds to the instruction to be executed. And so the processor increments the program counter, uh, looks at what instruction the program memory produces, and executes it. So in our example, this might be an addition, followed by a jump, indicating that the program counter should increment by 3, which would cause the processor to jump to address uh, hex 104, where it continues execution, executes the load, the store, the division, and then another jump, this one telling it to subtract 5 from the program counter, which would cause it to jump back to uh, address hex 102, where it continues execution, uh, executes the multiply, and encounters another jump, the absolute jump in this case, telling it to replace the current value in the program counter. This causes the process to jump to um, address hex uh, 108 and continue execution, executes the add, and finally arrives at the end of the program. Let me summarize this in a sort of wish list of what our processor needs to be able to do in order to execute programs. For one, uh, we need a register that acts as a program counter and that stores the address of the current instruction. Then we want to be able to increment the program counter in order to execute instructions in sequence, one after the other. But we also want to be able to perform relative jumps, like jumping three instructions ahead or five instructions backwards. And also absolute jumps, like jumping to the instruction at address hex 108. We also have to consider that some instructions might take more than one cycle to execute or that an instruction might need a functional block in the processor that's currently busy. Uh, in this case, we want to be able to disable the program counter such that it just stays where it is until we're ready to move ahead again. Finally, we should be able to reset the program counter such that we can restart the processor and have it run a program from the top. So let's get started right away by tackling this first item on the list. So let's start with two new fresh breadboards, because we're going to use uh, quite a lot of room to build up this program counter. And let's also immediately combine them, because these power rails here are detachable, uh, so we get like one rigid structure. So let's snap this off and actually combine the two. There we go. Now as a storage chip, we are going to use this 74HC377 chip, which is basically just a regular flip-flop, but it has a clock enable input, which is pretty handy because we can just disable the counter altogether and stop it from doing anything. Uh, this might be useful if, for example, we need more time to execute the current instruction or something up ahead is blocked in the pipeline and the processor cannot continue. So let's start with that. There we 
go. And let's immediately hook up power and ground. Now, as a first step, we want to observe what's actually in this register. It's not doing anything yet, but later on when it starts counting, we want to see what the current like count in the program counter is. So let's use one of these like bar graph LED displays, uh, which we've used before in our counter test circuit. And let's hook that up to the program counter. We'll use a register array to connect all the LEDs to ground through a resistor. While I'm at it, let me add some decoupling capacitors to the power rail. Let's connect the power rails of the boards. And let's power this up for a second to see if the LEDs are working. Great, that seems to be working. Now let's wire up this register here. Pin 11 is the clock input, which we'll just tie low for the moment. Pin one is the active low clock enable of the register. So for the time being, let's just pull that low. So whenever the clock toggles, the register is actually doing something interesting. And now to see what's actually in this register here, let's wire up all the outputs of the register to corresponding LEDs over here so we can observe what's going on. Let me break out the uh, inputs to the register here over to somewhere on this side of the breadboard so we have an easier time to apply a bunch of patterns and see if the register is actually working. Let's try to load something into this register here. Um, right now we have all the inputs connected to ground, which, you know, all the LEDs are off, uh, is already what's in there. So let's hook up a pattern, maybe alternating ones and zeros, and see if uh, when we toggle the clock, we can actually get this to uh, store in there. Now, to drive this clock here, let me actually bring back the clock generator uh, that we've been building in the series so far. Uh, this lower part here is basically our testing circuit. Um, that is no longer needed because we know this thing is working. So let me quickly remove this. Uh, 
All right, there we go. So let's hook this clock generator up to the clock we have over here and also wire up uh, the power and ground. Immediately springs to life. Let me put that into step mode. All right, that's the clock connected. So let me issue a single clock cycle and let's see if the pattern I've configured here actually makes its way into the register and is displayed on the LEDs. And voila, there you go. Let me try a different pattern. It's a bit finicky with these wires over here, but we'll make do. All right, different pattern. Let me clock that in. And there we go. Now, another neat feature of the uh, 74HC377 we've used here is this clock enable line, which currently we have tied it low. So basically meaning the clock is always enabled at the moment. So whenever we hit the step button here, whatever's programmed here at the input is actually gonna be latched in here. Um, but let's say we have some circuitry here that's co computing the next uh, program counter position. But the current instruction we're executing, it's stalled for some reason. It requires access to a resource that is currently uh, occupied. Um, what we want to do in that case is actually not copy this new PC value into the register, but basically just wait there and do nothing. And for that, this line is super useful. So let me program a different pattern here and let's see if uh, we can use this clock enable here to actually prevent the uh, program counter from updating. All right, new pattern has a lot of zeros. So let's see if this works. Uh, this is currently tied low. Let me tie it high, which uh, for an active flow input means disable. So now the clock should be disabled. And if I hit the step button, nothing should change here. And there you go. No matter how often I press the clock, this thing will just remain in the current state. And as soon as we decide uh, to step forward and we want to update the program counter, we can just change this line, the clock enabled, back to zero. And if we hit step then, there you go the new value is latched into the program counter. So this is super useful. And it's a good starting point for all the different ways how we want to uh, basically update uh, the program counter. So we've seen that this thing works over here, uh, but to prevent this whole breadboard becoming a huge mess of wires, uh, let me clean up these wires and replace them with uh, some nicer uh, length cut wires. So things stay kind of neat. quite a tight fit, but let's see if it still works with these new wires. That looks pretty good. Let's change the pattern. Perfect. That seems to work. So if we look back at our wish list, we've managed to implement the program counter register. And in picking the 74HC377 chip, uh, we already got the enable signal for free as well. 
In the next episode, I would like to tackle the next item on the list, which is stepping ahead to the next instruction in the program. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you'd like to see more of this. And see you next time.